Amen. Thank you, Brother Scott and Christina. Thank you so much. All the musicians today, thank you for your ministry to us on the instruments, the choir, all the uh, singing, Brother Brandon leading us in worship of our Lord. Great to see you, folks. I want you to take your copy of the scriptures this morning. Turn to the book of Philippians, if you would, and get chapter 3 opened up in front of you. And while you're doing that, let me chat with you just briefly. And it has to be brief. Let me just get right on to what I need to say. And let me say this from the get-go. I wish I had more time to say what I'd like to say. And that is how much I, I love you as a church. I said some of this during the uh, earlier service. And, uh, and then how much I love your pastor. And he and I have been buddies. Is that inappropriate to say that about your pastor? I hope not. I treat him with the utmost respect and with great respect for his character and his life. He has been a friend of mine for a long time. I usually joke about him being a father figure to me, but I won't do that this morning. I've made myself promise not to mistreat him that way, so I won't say that except maybe once or twice more. But the point is, I am deeply appreciative in all sincerity of uh, his friendship, his, his faithfulness for so many years, long before he became your pastor, his heart for the Lord was so evident. You would think that we kind of coordinated our comments, but that's not the truth. It really isn't the truth. There's so much more I could say. And I have tried in the past to say some of those things, but I deeply love and appreciate him so very much. Lynn and I are grateful for this church, grateful for uh, your history, and can't wait to see uh, the new property later on when I'm finished here and after we eat lunch, when it'll all be time to go out there. It'll be exciting to see. Have I given you enough time to find Philippians 3? Have you found it by now? If you're stuck in Ezekiel, just act like you know what you're doing and just uh, don't worry about it, okay? You got Philippians 3. This brief letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Philippi is packed, obviously, as all of his epistles were, with doctrine and with practical application. It was a letter written to some friends who had, to a church friends who had sent him a gift. And let me just pause and say this. I'm not Paul and you're not the church at Philippi. But can I say this parenthetically and extremely emphatically how much uh, Lynn and I feel indebted to this church family. You prayed for us and I've had a handful of you come up today and just say, how are you doing in reference to the battle that I had with cancer of about four years ago? And I'm uh, turning the corner as far as being in remission for about four or four and a half years now, for which I'm grateful. You, dear friends, were constant, vocal, and in many other ways, supporters of us during those very difficult days of 2018. So I know a little bit of maybe what Paul was feeling. He was in a prison, a Roman prison, and the people in Philippi had sent him a gift, financial, probably some other things, notes and cards and just expressions of love. And Paul turns around and he sends this letter back in response to the church to say how much he loved them and to say to them that he was concerned about the fact that they had lost some of their initial joy. And that's why the overriding theme of the book or the letter to the church at Philippi is to rejoice. Not to be goofy, not to be silly, not to be a clown, but to rejoice. To recognize we're on the winning team. We're on the winning side. For further reference, read your Bible. And you can see that we, in the end, the score comes out in our favor if you know the Lord Jesus. And as he writes this letter, right in the heart, right in the middle, what we call chapter 3, Paul is only halfway through his letter. And I love the first word of chapter 3. It's the word, finally. He's only halfway through, but he knows that in order to keep people's attention, he needs to let them think, hey, he's almost finished, you know, we can, we can move right along. Finally, and Paul is going to give a testimony. His testimony. It's important to have a testimony like the one that Paul has. I want you to see what he has to say. Beginning in verse 1, follow me quickly and carefully. He says, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. 
To write the same things to you, to me indeed, is not grievous. That word is the idea of it's not difficult for me to do this. It's not tedious. It's not uh, hard work for me to do this. But for you, it is safe. Beware of dogs. Now, he's not talking about little domesticated pets. He's talking about human beings that are vicious. Beware of these dog-like people. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision. These are people who would add works to the grace of God. Grace is no longer grace if you have to add works to it. He says, Be, beware of these people who think you have to earn your way to God. Now he says in verse 3, For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh, though I might also have confidence in the flesh. If any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more circumcise the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ, yea, doubtless. And I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. This is a personal statement. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and I do count them but dung, that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, Either were already perfect, but I follow after if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. In this testimony, Paul is declaring a wonderful change that's taken place in his life. You know, there's a lot of changes going on in our world, isn't it? I mean, honestly, I mean, all you got to do is take a look at culture and you see culture changing. Society is changing. Laws change. Have you noticed that schools Across the country, they've changed. Um, people change. Have you noticed that? It's why it's always good to be around someone who hasn't changed uh, for the worse. And then people change. People let you down at work, school, in the neighborhood, whatever. Uh, things that are, that are difficult to handle, they change. And it's, it's uncomfortable. Churches change. Now, some changes in people's lives are good. I mean, they really are. It's good to watch a kid grow up, isn't it? I mean, it's really, it's enjoyable. Uh, we we uh, called our grandkids not too long ago, and we don't get to see our grandkids near enough. We just don't hardly see them enough at all. And so whenever we talk, I mean, it's a very special thing. And if we get to see them and squeeze them, I mean, that's even better. But we were talking to the granddaughters, and, and you know, they had their little sweet, little uh, girly voices, you know, and that sort of thing. And, and then all of a sudden, we ask about Drew, our grandson. Can we talk to Drew? And Drew, Drew came over to the phone, and all of a sudden, we heard, Hi, Papa. Hi, Nana. And we thought... Who is this? And what'd you do to our grandson? Well, he's, you know, and I'm not, I'm not matching it like I need to. He's, you know, at that time he was, I don't know, 12, 13, something like that. And you know what I'm talking about? That voice had changed. And he just, I mean, he just dropped down low volume. It's like, who is this? You know, that's a good change. There are good changes that take place. Look, I can remember when I was a kid growing up, 
As a kid in church, uh, I, for, in, in, in my childhood days, I don't think we had a children's church or any kind of a program for the children. So we would sit in the church building uh, with our parents and so forth. And in between Sunday school and church, I'd get permission every Sunday as a little boy to go over to the little convenience store that was right next to our church. And I would ba- buy a bag I hate to even declare this because it's going to show you how old I am. A little bag of sweet tarts. You know, sweet, doesn't that sound good right now? Let's dismiss and go ahead and go get a bag of sweet tarts right now. And they had them in bags, not those long rolls, just a little bag. And here's, here's where I'm going to date myself. You could get it for five cents. I think each sweet tart costs five cents now, you know, but I mean, I mean, it was, a long, and I got upset when they raised the price to six cents. One time, the young people look at me thinking, how old is this man up here, you know? Yeah, Ben Franklin and I would go over there and we'd buy the bag of sweet tarts. And I would sit in church because I didn't understand what pastor was preaching on. It was right over my head. And I'd sit there and I'd have that, I'd have in my coat pocket that little bag of sweet tarts. And, 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 and I'd just pull one out and, and I'd stick it in my mouth. And I'd go, ooh, I don't like that one. That's a green. I don't like that green one, you know. You know? And then I'd pull, ooh, that's a grape. I like that one, you know. And I'd be, I'd be eating those sweet tarts. And that little bag of sweet tarts it would last the whole church time, you know. It got me through. And then something happened. I can't even remember how old I was. I, early, mid-teens, somewhere, 14, something like that, something happened. I was not hungry for candy anymore. I was hungry to hear what pastor had to preach on. All of a sudden, something in my life changed to where I couldn't get enough of what he was preaching on. I, I got excited when the song service was going on. I can even remember, uniquely enough, I can remember singing songs that I was very familiar with and weeping. I remember singing, I love to tell the story. And I know how many times I've sung, I love to tell the story. How, did, how little did I know that God was getting me ready to someday tell the story. And I sat there and I began to weep. I love to tell the story. For those who know it best seem hungering and thirsting to hear it like the rest. And I, and I, and I remember praying to the Lord, Lord, I love, you, I love you and I love what you've done for me. And I was a kid. I didn't need sweet tarts anymore. I was, what, what was going on? I changed. That's all I'm saying. You could, you could stand up all over this room today and talk about the changes spiritually that have taken place in your life. That's what Paul is talking about. I've seen changes in people for the better, and you have as well. And it's a delightful thing to observe. Paul is talking about his testimony, and every child of God needs all three elements of this testimony in your life. The first part of his testimony, I call it B.C., before Christ. Paul's going to talk about what he was like before Jesus came into his life. And all of us start in life in this arena, B.C., before Christ. He's going to describe that. Then he's going to talk about how he was converted to Christ. That's the second part of the testimony. Then he's going to talk about what happened the rest of his life, as he was even writing this letter, what was going on in his life. Because the testimony doesn't stop when you move from this spot to this spot. You see, you know... There are, there are some arenas in which it seems like in some churches the only music that we ever sing are songs about salvation, which is wonderful. I love that. I think it's great. I think we need to reflect upon it. I preached on it in Sunday school. We need to rejoice and sing in it. And, and, and they either sing about, about when I got saved or when I get to heaven. Oh, it's going to be wonderful when I get to heaven someday. Yes, it is. But it seems like we always forget about this period of time between the day I got saved and the time before I get to heaven. Well, God's word doesn't overlook it. And Paul's testimony deals with it point blank. Take a look at his testimony. Ask yourself where you are. Look at the B.C. section before Christ. Look at you would please beginning in verse. uh, Let's start in verse uh, uh, four. Though I might also have confidence in my Human flesh, he's talking about his life. If any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the, in the flesh, I more. Now he's going to say, here's what I was before Christ. Circumcised the eighth day. He was saying, I had the right beginning in life. They say he's a Jewish boy. And they were observing that, that Hebrew circumcision on the eighth day. Paul said, by that one statement, I came from a good home. I, 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 it was before Jesus came into my life, before Christ, but I had a good beginning. 
I had a very good beginning. I was circumcised the eighth day. Then he says what? He said, not only that, he said, I was of the stock of Israel. He goes, man, I was blue blood. I was true blue. I was an Israelite. I'm not, a, I'm not partial uh, in, in my Israeli blood. He goes, I am all in with being an Israelite. No question about it. He goes, I had the right beginning. I had the right nationality. He said, I had the right tribe. Look at it. He says, of the tribe of Benjamin. Well, you say, no, what's the big deal about Benjamin? Well, Benjamin and Judah were the two tribes that stayed with the Davidic kingdom, with the kingdom of David. And they were always an honored tribe as a result of such. The first king of Israel, Saul, came from the tribe of Benjamin. So Paul says here, he says, I, I, I even came from the right tribe, man. He goes, I had the right start. And not only that, he says, I was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. Now, what does that mean? It means this. It means he says, I was trained strongly in the, the teachings of the books of, of Moses and of the Old Testament law. And he says, can I, can I put it like this? He says, I was educated with a Christian education. He, he possibly could have said, I'm homeschooled. I was homeschooled. I mean, I came from a great family. I had a great beginning, a great nation, the right tribe. And he says, I had the right training. I was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. I had a great start to life. Then he says, not only that, he said, I had the right energy. He says there, verse 6, concerning zeal, persecuting the church. He was saying, man, he goes, I was all in at being a, a, a Pharisee. I was attacking Christianity. I was not kind of on the edge. People knew where I stood. He goes, I was all in with my religion. Then he says, I was, uh, then he says, concerning or touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. He said, I even had the right morality. I was just a good person. I was a decent person. Here's what Paul was saying. Let me put it on the bottom shelf. He was saying, if being religious gets you to God, he goes, I was at the front of the line. If, if, if being a good person gets you in, uh, uh, close to, to being close to the uh, godly lifestyle, he goes, I was the head of the class. And he was saying this, I was sincere. But I was sincerely wrong. And he recognized someone was desperately missing in his life. That's why he says in verse, what is it, verse 7, pick it up with me. What things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Paul said there was a day in which I looked at my life and I recognized I had all these good things going for me. All this religion, all this religious activity, all the good morality going on in my life. But there was a vacuum. There was a hole in my life until I recognized I needed Jesus Christ. And he made a positional change in his spiritual life. Now, don't miss this. Paul was declaring that he was looking good on the external, but someone was missing on the internal. Paul was... Paul was Basically making a metaphor when he says those things which were gained to me were actually a loss. He was saying this, I was looking at my checkbook spiritually. I was looking at my ledger and I found out that I was bankrupt. I was bankrupt. You know, the Bible gives all kinds of metaphors like going from rags to riches, you know, or being guilty in a courtroom and Jesus becomes our lawyer and, and we take his place and he takes our place. Those are wonderful metaphors. Here's one that Paul's making. He was saying, I thought I was rich, but he said I was bankrupt until I stepped into a relationship with Jesus Christ. I saw this visibly just a... Oh, boy, what am I looking at? This is October. Two months ago, two months ago, I was in New England, and I was preaching, and a 20, 20, 21-year-old young man came up to me, and he simply said to me, he says, I am trying the very best I can, the very best I can to get to God. And I said, do what? He said, look, he goes, I work hard at not sin, not, not sinning. He goes, I... I've had some addictions in my life. He says, I've had things that have grabbed me in my past. And he says, I'm doing everything I can to live for God. And he says, he goes, I still sin. I go, yeah. I said, that's not going to work out for you, is it? He says, no. And I said, son, have you ever recognized your need 
is the Savior? You need Jesus. You can't get yourself to God. And for a while, you could see the blinders on his eyes. And the more I presented Jesus to him, the more I gave him the gospel, all of a sudden, it was a beautiful, I've never seen this happen before. It was beautiful. He looked at me. It was like the light went on in his head. And he turned and he said, oh, God, I'm a sinner and I need you to come into my life. Save me, Jesus. I've been trying to save myself. Please come into my life right now. I didn't, I didn't even tell him you need to pray. He just broke into prayer and genuinely called on Jesus to be his Savior. Have you been going to church all your life, living a good life and having good moral decency in your life, and yet there's never been a specific time in your life when you said, Jesus, I need you and only you, for you are the only one who can bring salvation. There is a positional salvation that takes place. Someday when we get to heaven, there'll be perfected salvation. No more battling this flesh and sin. Glory. But until we get there, Paul begins to talk about a progressive salvation or growth and sanctification that takes place. What does that look like? Well, let Paul describe his testimony further. He says in verse 10, look at it. He says, that I may know him. Paul not only talked about how he was converted, he's now talking about the growth that's going to take place in his life. A preacher of yesteryear pastored at Westminster um, Abbey uh, in uh, London for years. and Brilliant mind and people would come and they would hear him preach and they listened to him preach. They were fascinated by his insights and his teaching of the word of God and a man was going to write a biography about this particular preacher and they stood out in the lobby when the pastor was standing there and people kept walking by and people, as they often do with a pastor, they, they'd come by and they'd say, oh, pastor, I sure needed today's message. Thank you for that. Next person would come along and said, oh, pastor, pray, please pray for me. I'm, I'm really going through some real battles. Somebody else said, pray, pray for our family. Pastor, I've never heard you any better. That was you know, Just all those kind comments as people would become walking by. There was a line of people there from the church leaving the church building. The man that was going to write the biography was standing nearby. He wanted to overhear. He wanted to hear the preacher's response to every person that came by. And uniquely enough, he discovered that it, with every single person, he said the same thing regardless of what somebody said to him he said the same thing when they finished their statement he just simply said well keep moving keep moving and at first the writer the author thought he was saying keep keep moving you know keep them doggies rolling roll you know just keep moving I got a long line of people here but that's not what he was talking about he was talking wherever you are spiritually keep moving Thank you for your prayer request. Thank you for your kind comment. But just keep moving. Don't be stagnant. Many a Christian gets stuck in cruise control, in neutral, and they just kind of float through life. There was a period of time when you were growing pretty rapidly and, and strengthening in your walk with the Lord, but then all of a sudden you've kind of hit in cruise control and just sort of cruising along. You know, revival is not some spooky feeling. It is an awareness that I need to be Stepping forward with progression in my Christianity and moving on. Going at the pace that God would have me to go. Not living with the break on, but moving forward for him and recognizing that there's more to learn. What is it? Well, he says here again, verse 10, that I may know him. Paul says here, I, I have a new pursuit. He's telling his friends in Philippi, I have a new pursuit. What is it? I want to know him. Oh, you say, well then, so Paul's not been saved very long. Is that true? No, friends. When Paul wrote these words, he had been a convert for over 30 years. What was he saying? He was saying, there's so much more for me to learn about my Lord. I just want to know him. And he wasn't saying, I want to know about him. I want to know of him. He was saying, I want to know him. I want to hear his voice speaking directly to me. I have a new pursuit. Friends, God 
The Lord Jesus is not some hotel room that you check in on Sunday morning and you kind of spend some time there with him and then you go on with the rest of your life and check out when it's over with. No, Paul was saying, I want to pursue him. I want to hear his voice. I want to know what he's saying to me. I have a new pursuit. Number two, he says, I have a new power. Look at verse 10 again. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection. What could be more powerful than resurrection? Now you go ask a little kid, what's the most powerful thing on earth? They're going to say, oh, Superman, you know, Batman, you know, the Hulk, Pastor Pittman. You know, something that is, something that is uh, great strength. I couldn't wait to get to that. And, 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 and the more scientific brain would come along and say, no, 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 it's gravity. Somebody else would say, no, 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 it's, uh, it, is, it is electromagnetism. Most powerful force. Somebody else says, no, no, no. It's nuclear force, the most powerful force on earth. I have this to contend with that whole statement. What's more powerful than the resurrection from the dead? Nothing's more powerful than that. And Jesus demonstrated it when he rose from the dead. And Paul is saying here, I want to know more about that. I want to know more about that kind of power. Do you know anything about this kind of power? You say, what do you mean? How about power over sin? Power over temptation? Power in your witness. Power in your prayer life. Now, if you just want to get by in life and just kind of float along, then don't progress in this area. But if you say, Morris, I'm tired of being knocked off my feet spiritually, then you need to have this part of your testimony active. Paul says, I have a new pursuit. I have a new power. I don't have time for this, but he says, I also have a new partnership. Look at there again, verse 10. And I want to know the fellowship of his sufferings. You know, when you really get to know the Lord is when you're going through things that are difficult trials. Very hardship trials of life. And Paul says, I have a new partnership. Paul says, I've gotten to know the Lord through these crises of my life. And maybe tonight somebody's going through a particular difficult time in your life. And God is calling you closer to him to know that sweet partnership, the fellowship of his sufferings. And one more thing. He says down in verse 13 and 14, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. I haven't reached everything I need to reach. But he says in verse 14, I press toward the mark. He's, he's talking about running a race. We just heard a special about this. Dare to run. That word press there means I'm leaning toward the finish line. Like a runner running, he's leaning into the finish line. He goes, I'm pressing toward it. I'm not in cruise control. I'm leaning forward to what? Toward bearing down to the target of pleasing my God. Because someday I will have that perfected salvation. But until I get there, he goes, I have a new perspective. What's that? I'm living for that day. I'm living for that day, and I want to hear my God say to me someday, well done. You finished the race that I gave you to live. You did what was right. Paul said, I have in my testimony a new pursuit. I want to know him. I have a, I have a new power in my Christianity. I have a new partnership with him, and I have a new perspective. I'm living for that day. I'm not living for this day and what I can accomplish for my own benefit. I'm living for his glory that day. One night, years ago, Lynn and I told our boy that it was time to get ready for bed and to get his room cleaned up and get his pajamas on. And I don't know a boy in the world that ever likes to go to bed. And our, boy, our boys never did. And so he, uh, he drug his feet. He wasn't getting the job done. He wasn't getting his, himself uh, cleaned up in the room and everything. And I walked by his room. And I just caught his eye and I said, Hey, buddy, we've told you to get this room cleaned up. It's time to get ready for bed. And he could tell by the look in my eye and the tone of my voice, I'm serious. Get with it now. Well, boy, all of a sudden, man, he started cleaning stuff up and throwing it in the closet and getting things, you know, put up and begin to bury out from the day's activities, all that. And he found his little brother underneath there and, you know, and just kind of, uh, and just began to clean up everything in the room and got his pajamas on. And after he got it all fixed up, he came and he found me. He said, Daddy, Daddy, come here. And I walked down the hall and he said, Daddy, 
And we stood in his room. He said, Daddy, look. Like, like one of those people on a game show. It's a new car, you know. And he, he said, Daddy, look. And I said, son, did you do this all by yourself? I knew, of course, he did. He said, yes, sir. And then he said, Daddy, does it make you proud of me? How do you squeeze a kid tight enough to let him know how proud you are of him? I want to, I want to squeeze him so tight his eyeballs would bulge out. I prayed with him, got him in bed, and he was asleep pretty quick. And I walked by his room later on, I got on my knees. I gently put my hand on his body. And in my heart, I said, Lord, this little boy wants his daddy to be proud of him. And I want you to be pleased with me too. I want to live for that day. How's your testimony this morning? Are you progressing? Or are you stuck in cruise control? Would you bow your heads with me? Paul's testimony he said, before I got anywhere, I realized there was a big hole in my life. And I came to Jesus. I want to say to anyone in this building right now, if you've never put your trust in Jesus Christ, and you don't even know what that means maybe, we'd love to pray for you. You're in a room of friends. We want to be a help to you today. Please don't go away without Jesus. He is the one you need. It's not your religious good works. It's Jesus. Christian, did God put a tug on your heart today? Did he speak to you about having that pursuit to know him? Oh, I wish I could have said more about that. To hear his voice. To pursue him like never before. Do you want this power that Paul spoke of? You say, Morris, I really do. God spoke to me about that. And the partnership with him. And I want to live with the right perspective on that final day. Would you stand with heads bowed all over the room? Just stand with me. If God has challenged your heart about something, would you find maybe a room here at this altar this morning? I'm going to pray briefly. Music will begin. The song will be, the song, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. You find a place to get on your knees. If you don't want to get on your knees, then sit back down on the front row or at your pew and say, God, I needed this. I needed to hear from you today. God, help me to have this kind of effective change testimony in my life. Don't wait to see what someone else is going to do. From all over this room, you let the Lord do a, a continual progressive work. Keep moving. Let it occur today. Father, finish this service with your divine blessing. Speak to our hearts even as we respond to you in the next few moments. Bring people to Jesus for salvation. And yet, Lord, I pray for your people. May we progressively move forward with firmness of conviction to live for that day when we will see you. Finalize this service as only you can. We ask it in your wonderful name. Heads are bowed. Would you come right now as the music begins? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Don't wait for someone else. God's spoken to your heart about something. Let's take time to speak to our Lord. Lord, I want to keep moving. I'm not going to re-preach the sermon. If you need to sit down and pray, do so. Get on your knees. Respond to your Lord all over this room.